Romans chapter 5. We begin a new chapter today and we'll, Lord willing, tackle the first two verses. <laughs> Don't want to take too much, just a little bit at a time. No hurry. That's <laughs> so much. You'll see why, I think, here in a moment. Once you find your way there, if you would please stand, if you're able. If not, that's okay, but I'll have you follow along as I read the text. The Apostle Paul, again, writing by the Holy Spirit, says in verse 1, Romans 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let's ask God's blessing on our understanding. Lord, as we've just read these verses, and as we've really just opened up our ears to hear the reading of these verses, our heart's desire is, is that you would speak ever so powerfully in and through them into our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I want to begin with a question, actually two questions. Do you ever have times when you're so overwhelmed with anxiety that you start to panic in fear. Fear just grips you. I mean, you trust God and you have faith in God, but you're unsure, uncertain. Another question. Have you ever felt that something was missing in your life? Again, you, you know the Lord, you love the Lord, you're walking with the Lord, but something just isn't quite right. It's not like it was once before. Well, be of good cheer. And here's why. In just these first two verses of Romans chapter 5, we're about to see three truths and these three truths are there for us, set on the table for us to reclaim and partake of, and they have the propensity to fill that emptiness in our lives. Today's teaching is gonna be part one of a new series that I've chosen to title, There's Something Missing in My Life. Can't quite put your finger on it, that's okay, the Apostle Paul is going to do that for us. Now, at the risk of sounding sensational and provocative, this chapter that we have set before us has the potential to change our lives in a profound way, even just with the first two verses. And by the way, I'm not alone in this. There are many others, some of whom are now with the Lord that had some very powerful things to say about Romans chapter 5, the chapter that we're beginning today. One of them was Martin Luther. He said, quote, In the whole Bible, there is hardly another chapter which can equal this triumphant text. <laughs> Can't wait. Doesn't that just get your, your blood pumping? No? Okay. Does mine. <laughs> Can't wait. The Apostle Paul is going to turn a corner beginning here in verse 1, and he is going to reshift the focus now from how God's grace works to what God's grace accomplishes. Now, let me explain that. That which God is giving vis a vis grace may be the very thing that is now missing in our lives or is no longer real in our lives. And if the mask was taken off of our Christian lives, others would see that we're just going through the motions. 
we're faking it. We may have once had it, but have long since left it, not lost it, like the church of Ephesus in Revelation, the first church, left her first love. See, it changes the complexion of the meaning when you say, I left it as opposed to I lost it, because if I lost it, that would imply that I need to go searching for it to find it. No, if I left it, that implies and infers a deliberate act Though be it over a long period of time, my closeness to the Lord, my love for the Lord has dissipated over time. I I no longer have the same excitement for the Lord or about the Lord that I once had. Well, we're going to see the first one in verse 1, and the Apostle Paul is going to put his finger on the pulse of the problem of what it is that I may be missing in my life. Peace with God. In verse 1, he says that since we have been justified through faith by God, we now have peace with God by virtue of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, Uh, Some of your translations may render this, we have peace with God as, let us have peace with God. Sadly, that's a poor translation of the text at best, and I'll tell you why. It would seem to indicate that the jury is still out on peace with God. Let us have peace with God. I'll tell you another example of that the jury being out, is found in the Aaronic blessing in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 25, where we insert the word not let, but may. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord, you know, uh, make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord. No, there's no may in my Bible. There's no may in the text. The Aaronic blessing, there's no may. No, it's the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. This is the same thing here. It's that peace with God. It's not, let us have peace with God. No, we already have peace with God. Or do we? Now, Paul is establishing in verse 1 this justification, past tense, which results in peace, present tense, and as we'll see shortly, glory, future tense. Let me say it this way. The war is over. Oh, not the war, not the battle with the flesh. That's not over until we get our new bodies, which I'm hoping is really soon. (laughs) And so are you, I think. Not you young people. you're, You're just kids. You're just a baby. Anyway us older people, (laughs) your elders. Not the battle with the world. We're in the world, not of the world. Not the battle with the devil. No, this is that battle against God, being at enmity with God. That war is over. A ceasefire has been declared, and here's the deal. I had nothing to do with it. And now... I have peace with God because of it. And because I didn't have anything to do with it. Now this might be deemed a firm grasp of the obvious, but I think we would all do well to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul's writing. Namely, that just because the war is over doesn't necessarily mean that I've stopped fighting. Fighting God. At enmity with God too friendly with the world, committing adultery with the world. Read James. Just because the war is over doesn't mean I'm living my Christian life as if it were. I would suggest that we as Christians are so prone to live our lives like God is mad at us, angry with us, still at war with us, and His anger, it's soon coming down upon us. 
mean, we've seen all the bumper stickers. They haven't worn off yet. Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he ticked. That doesn't help. It just further reinforces that God is a God of wrath. If, if he's like that, I'm going to keep my distance. See, this type of Christian experience will be marked by my continually hiding from God and running from God and distancing myself from God. And the consequences of living my life in that way is that I end up forfeiting of my own volition this peace with God and subsequently the peace of God. Please make that distinction. The peace of God comes when we have peace with God. Perhaps you've heard it said that if you first don't have peace with God, you'll never know the peace of God. Jesus said, I come to give you peace. That is the world gives. The peace that I'm going to give you is the peace that the Apostle Paul describes in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It surpasses human understanding. It, it bypasses, surpasses logic. This, this is a lasting peace. This is a true peace from the one who said, I come to give you that peace. Now the problem is, is that we, if we're running from God, distancing ourselves from God, we don't have the peace with God, we're still at war with God, then I become like that soldier who's found years after the war had ended and he's still living in isolation he's still building a fortification he didn't know the war was over he didn't know that there was a, a ceasefire we do this with God we distance ourselves we build walls around ourselves and in so doing we live joyless and fruitless and powerless Christian lives now, if you were to ask me what I thought was one of the most successful campaigns of Satan, I would have to answer that he's deceived us into believing that God is mad at us. Because, see, he knows that's how he can get us to distance ourselves from him. You know, growing up, I didn't have a very good or healthy or close relationship with my earthly father. And by the way, I think you know what I mean when I say this. It made for some difficulties in my relationship with my Heavenly Father early on in my uh, Christian life. But he was a very angry man. And uh, I, I would walk on eggshells every time I you know, walked into the home. And I would make a point of uh, you know, sleeping in until he, I knew he had left the house and going to bed early. Uh, before he came back to the house. <laughs> it's a great parenting technique to get your kids in bed early, I guess. I don't know, but it worked with me anyway. Because he was always angry with me. I was a disappointment to him. He was never proud of me. I know he loved me. But then I realized one time when my mom told me that if I only knew how he was raised... <laughs> It wouldn't excuse it, but it sure would explain it. But see, there was this war in my relationship with him. There was never peace in the home. And because of it, I built these walls around my life, and I always lived under this oppressive anger, and there was never joy, because I... He was always mad at me. One of the greatest truths, most freeing truths in my life was when God just ministered to me that uh, he's not mad at me. <laughs> and then, you know, I usually ask him, well, what about what I did last week? You're, you're not still mad about that? Because <laughs> isn't that how we, you know, function? We think, oh, man, I better you know, let God cool down for, you know, a couple of days and before I, you know, talk to him because, you know, surely that's, uh, no, listen, if you hear nothing else that I say today, hear this. 
God took all of his anger, all of his wrath, and he placed it on his only begotten son because he so loved the world. And all of the wrath was paid for for all of our sin when it was paid for. And it is finished. So now he sees not our sin. He sees his son. He's not, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but... This explains, I believe, why it is, at least in part, that Christians are not joyful. And this is why Christians don't read their Bible. And this is why Christians don't pray, hey, I better, you know, God's mad right now. I mean, here's how we think, and this is how Satan has succeeded in getting us to think this way. It's stinking thinking, by the way. You know about stinking thinking, right? It's, you need, and you need to check up from the neck up when you get stinking thinking. You know about that, right? Good, okay, just wanna make sure. But he knows this, the battleground's in the mind. So he plants these thoughts that you better not pray. In fact, if I were you, I wouldn't go to church. Man, you call yourself a Christian. And he's got us deceived into believing that if we pray, you know, when we come sheepishly before the throne of grace, not boldly before the throne of grace, sheepishly, you know, Lord, what? <laughs> and so we're like, hey, this isn't a good time. If I think God is mad at me, I'll do everything to keep my distance from him. Conversely, if I know I have peace with him, I'll draw near to him. And in turn, James says, he'll draw near to me. Here's the bottom line. There's nothing I can do to make God angry with me or have less love for me. Why? Because my justification was not accomplished by me. This will come into clear focus in a moment. Charles Spurgeon of this says, faith lays hold upon the righteousness of Jesus and so makes us just before the Lord. And this brings a heavenly peace into the soul. No self-confidence can ever do this. Our own good works are faulty and can neither make peace for us nor work peace in us. What a joy it is to be just before God. No wonder that the man who is so favored enjoys peace of soul. Do you have that peace today? Do you have that peace with God today? Or is it missing in your life? Maybe it's missing in your life because of the second one found in the first part of verse 2. Maybe it's because of my access to God that I don't have peace with God. The first part of verse 2, Paul goes on to write that through Jesus Christ, we have gained access by faith into this grace, which is now the basis upon which we stand. Okay, this is interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that it carries the idea of having access to someone in a very high-ranking position. You know, one of the marvels of the Christian life is that at any moment we can call upon the Lord and not receive voicemail. I'm just saying. <laughs> he, he's always available. We have access to him all the time. When Jesus said, it is finished, that which separated the holy place from the holy of holies, I, I'm reluctant to call it the veil because it gives the idea of being a thin veil that separated the holy place and the temple from the holy of holies. It wasn't. Some Bible scholars believe it was a curtain that was a foot and a half thick. You imagine the sound when that thing ripped? Oh. When he said it is finished, 3D IMAX. And now all of a sudden we had access. 
into the holy of holies where the Shekinah glory of God is. All the time. The presence of God. Do you realize that prior to that, only one man, one day, every one year, could access the presence of God. And when he did, it was not well, let me say it this way. I think you know. What's the point of it? He had to tie a bell, we're told, to the feet of the high priest going in to make atonement on the Day of Atonement. And the reason they did that is because if they didn't hear it ringing, that means that God killed him. No, I'm serious. And they would drag him out, and they would have a rope, and that's the only way. Otherwise, he'd be in there and stinketh for a whole year until the next high priest went in. I know that's humorous, but it's serious too. You mean to tell me that now I have that access to God every day, all day? Yes! Wow. <laughs> okay, we got a problem though. If God's still mad at me, then so too would God not be accessible to me. Maybe that's the problem. See, if I have peace with God, so too will I have access to God. And this peace with God and access to God is grace-based. And if the truth be known, we don't want it any other way, right? You know why? Because if it was any other way, then there would be absolutely no way because it would be contingent on, predicated upon my doing good, my being good. And if the peace with God and access to God was based on my good works for God, then my peace would be temporary and my access would be limited. Oh, I can't access the throne of grace because I didn't tithe. You didn't? No, I said, you didn't repent. <laughs> I didn't pray. I didn't read my Bible. I don't have access, and I surely don't have peace with God because I wasn't a very good boy. I wasn't a very good girl. My access is limited. My peace, temporary. Could you imagine living your life like that? Maybe you are. Are you? Stop. How? Just stop it. <laughs> no, God always gives us the how of the Holy Spirit to do the what of his holy word. The how is found in accessing the throne of grace. If you're not accessing the God who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, you have no hope of having any peace. Let me give you an illustration. Here, here's what it would be like. It'd be like someone I don't even know just walking into my office, the church office, and, you know, thinking he has unlimited access to me. Well, I'll tell you, he's got another thing coming. <laughs> yeah, I'd get Palestinian. What are you doing? I have an appointment with you. Who are you? What's your name? What are you doing here? I wouldn't do that. That's not very loving, but I'm just saying. It's an illustration. Just bear with me. Now, he would first need to have an appointment with me in order to have access to me, right? But what if instead he walks in the front door with one of my sons? No problem. My son has unlimited access to me. Why? Because he's my son. You see where I'm going? This is how it is, and this is the way it is that we have gained access by faith into this grace. We now stand on the basis of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Because of the Son, we have unlimited access to the throne of God. Do you have that access today? Here's our third and last one we'll look at today. It's found in the second part of verse 2, and it's confidence in God. Here, Paul explains how it is that we can rejoice in the hope or 
I believe better translated that we can have confidence in the hope that we'll receive the glory of God. Here's another way to read and understand this verse. It would be that we now have a sanctified boldness. We enter into his courts with praise and thanksgiving, but now we can boldly, not arrogantly, confidently, not in ourselves, we can confidently access the throne and enter into his presence with praise and thanksgiving because of the certainty of God's glory. It's for this reason that I can rejoice with a new song on my lips and a new spring to my step and a sincere smile on my face and a pure joy in my heart. That's how, that's when, that's the way. Charles Spurgeon again says it ever so eloquently in that old English being at perfect peace with God, we are enabled to approach him. And in his presence, we obtain a fullness of joy. Do we know anything about this? Let us answer this question, each one of us, for himself. How would you answer that question? Do you have that peace with God? Because of your access to God? And your confidence in God? And has it accomplished in his presence that fullness of joy? It's Psalm 1611, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. How am I going to get that fullness of joy if I'm not accessing him? I don't have confidence in him. Could it be that missing all three, that peace with God, that access to God, that confidence in God, that we need look no further as to why it is that we have hurting hearts, empty hearts, and not joyful hearts? Now please, hear my heart. If you're going through the trial of your life right now, I in no way want to come off as if I'm understating that, the enormity of that which you find yourself in the midst of. Please don't misunderstand me. But if there's no joy in your heart, could it be that this is why? Is that what's missing? Is this why it's missing? If I do not possess peace with God, neither will I have access to the throne of God, and therein lies my problem of not having the fullness of joy from God. Here's a closing question. Have you ever looked with disdain at a Christian who always seems joyful? Don't answer. Don't raise your hands. No, I know you guys don't. You guys are great. You know, the other carnal Christians, other churches, they do that. I mean, you, their, their world around them is crashing and falling apart at every turn, and yet they still seem to be steadfast in this joy, and it's not a fake joy. It's, it's the real deal. It's real fruit. It's not plastic fruit. And you look with a, a jealousy and an, an envy because you do not possess that joy. But you want to. You want what they have, but you don't have what they have. Sadly, the response is usually amongst well-intentioned Christians to tear down the Christian who has the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is their strength. And that just really rubs you the wrong way. Where did they get it? How can I get it? I want that peace with God. I want that access to God. I want that confidence in God. William Newell said, alas, 
How few believers have the courage of faith when some saint here or there does begin to, listen, believe the facts and walk in shouting liberty. Sorry if I woke anybody up. We say perhaps secretly, he must be an especially holy, consecrated man. <laughs> no. He's just a poor sinner like you who's believing in the abundance of grace. Do you believe it? Do you believe you can have this peace with God and the peace of God? Access to God, confidence in God, it's there waiting for you. I'm not angry. <laughs> I suppose I could say I'm passionate about this, and I'll close with this. Because Satan robbed me for so many years in my Christian life, living under this. I could never experience the, the freedom, that triumphant, victorious Christian life. Because I was always walking around going, I'm not a very good Christian, I know. I mean, look at them. They got it all together. They've always got a smile on their face. <laughs> if that's you here this morning, this is where it ends. And this is where it begins. This is where it ends. Do not leave this church with that image in your mind of a God who's angry at you. And if you've been running from God and distant from God, you need to have the image in your mind of that father with his arms wide open waiting in the garage. Barbecue, musubi, all that stuff on the side. <laughs> Big feast. Waiting with open arms to receive you back. Would you please stand? Lord, we're... needing to revisit how we view you. And Lord, thank you that this is who you are and this is how you are and this is what grace can accomplish in our lives. Lord, for anyone here this morning that has been fighting and battling and struggling Lord, would you just reveal yourself to them that they can have that peace with you? Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. If you would just please stay in an attitude of prayer.